Welcome to the fourth episode in a Legendarium series about the English Civil War. In this installment, Choosing Sides, we will talk about how ordinary people had to make a terrible choice as to whether to support the king or parliament, and their choice could very likely set them against friends and family. In June 1641, Parliament sent a final peace offering to King Charles, who had fled London to York. The so-called 19 propositions from Parliament effectively demanded that King Charles hand over management of the church and taxes and the army to Parliament in exchange for enough money to finance his war in Scotland. King Charles, not without reason, saw this as an end to the monarchy itself. From there, matters escalated with stunning speed. On July 12, 1641, Parliament voted to raise an army to force the king to come to terms. King Charles himself raised the royal standard at Nottingham in August to summon all those who would serve to him. This became the first civil war in England fought in over 160 years. Most of the West Country and Wales declared for King Charles, while the East and the South did the same for Parliament. This would be very different from the dynastic wars fought during the late medieval era. This one didn't just involve competing claims to the throne, it involved ideas that mattered deeply to people, such as liberty, law, the church, and the monarchy. And thanks to the printing press, it became possible to communicate with and mobilize ordinary people in numbers never imagined only 100 years ago. Later histories tried to make the division between royal cavaliers and parliamentary roundheads about class, portraying royal cavaliers fighting for King Charles wearing satin and lace, while parliamentary roundheads from the middle and working class wore linen and leather, an early version of Richard Nixon's Republican cloth cloak. Yet, region mattered far more to people in deciding their loyalties, and great aristocratic families were just as likely to fight against Charles as for him. Most of the time, family and community matter far more to us than whatever screaming and shouting is going on in the capital. Yet sometimes, people can't ignore politics and the English Civil War was such a time. People had to make agonizing decisions over where their loyalty lay, not just to king and parliament, but to their communities, their churches, and their families. The Verney family offered a heartbreaking example. Edmund Verney the Elder sat alongside his son Ralph during the great parliamentary debates of 1640. And now, despite his anger at the king's policies, Edmund the Elder chose to fight for the king against what he saw as an overreaching parliament. Eventually, his younger son, also named Edmund, would fight for King Charles. Meanwhile, Ralph, his eldest son, would serve parliament. Despite the terrible division that sundered their family, they remained a family. And they were not the only one forced to divide from loved ones during the Civil War. A great many commanders filled their letters with lamentations about lost friend and estranged family members who were fighting against them during this terrible war. And what kind of army did these reluctant soldiers fight in? They weren't very well run. A commander of a regiment was simply anybody, typically an aristocrat or a magnate, who was able to finance the mustering of a unit of men. If they could show that they were able to finance the raising of a regiment, they would get a contract from either King Charles or Parliament. And since they saw the regiment as their property, they felt no qualms about appointing their friends, relatives, and flunkies to become officers. Needless to say, corruption thrived. 
officers would continue collecting wages for dead soldiers and pocket them. Sometimes they even stole wages and supplies from soldiers while they were still alive. When the army was on the march in the countryside, they simply had to sleep on the ground, whether there was frost or bugs or mud. And if they were near a village or serving garrison duty in a town, then civilians would be forced to share their houses, barns, and warehouses with dozens of unruly and sometimes drunken soldiers. Soldiers made things even worse by competing with civilians for jobs. At first, people were willing to join the army for cash bonuses, adventures, and three square meals a day, which was no mean offer during the hardships caused by the Little Ice Age. Yet as the war dragged on, officers increasingly resorted to taking people from jails, rounding up vagrants, and even recruiting people at gunpoint. These unwilling recruits had to be escorted to the army camp by armed guards and were always high risks for desertion. And if you think this didn't make for very good armies, then you were right. The first great battle of the English Civil War, Edge Hill, would more than prove that. King Charles personally led his army to London, hoping to quash the rebellion before it could spread. London was garrisoned by parliamentary troops, and the Earl of Essex, who had pledged his loyalty to Parliament, rushed to stop the king. The two armies literally woke up to find themselves within a few miles of each other, close enough to see the smoke from their campfires. The officers woke up their men and formed them into lines, and because the recruits were so raw and ill-trained, this took several hours, and the battle couldn't even start until 2 p.m. First, the two sides exchanged artillery fire for about an hour. Then Prince Rupert, the nephew of King Charles, accompanied by his toy poodle named Boy, drove the parliamentary cavalry from the battlefield. However, Prince Rupert took too long in pursuing the rebels, and Essex was able to push the king back. Total disaster for King Charles was only prevented by Prince Rupert returning before night. The soldiers on both sides had to sleep in the frost, and they had nothing for dinner or for breakfast as the second day of the battle began. Likely in part because of hunger, they were simply too weak to fight, and both sides withdrew. While it would be fair to call this battle a draw, King Charles was ultimately the loser because he lost his only chance to stop the rebellion before it could spread. One of the 2,000 dead left on the battlefield was Edmund Verney, who had died carrying the king's standard, and before the war was over, he would lose his younger son, Edmund the Younger, fighting in Ireland. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this installment of The Legendarium. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.